we're going to start a new series uh, this morning. And if I was to tell you it was about a fellow that has hallucinations and runs around naked, would you be interested? <laughs> That's who Ezekiel was, the prophet, in a foreign land called Babylon. And uh, we're going to be looking at Ezekiel today as you, you look through the first three chapters and, and see about uh, his call and the, the uh, challenge God gave him, the commission God gave to him. And we're going to talk about God's call for our day because just like God called Ezekiel, he calls us in today's world as well. So a little background on Ezekiel. Um, <clears throat> the book of Ezekiel has three parts to it. And it's very organized. The first part's about the approaching fall of Jerusalem and the announcements Ezekiel makes about that, chapters 1 through 24. Then it talks about the prophecies against all the foreign nations, chapters 25 to 32. And then the prophecies of Israel's future restoration, chapters 33 through 48. So it makes a nice uh, three-part division in the book. And uh, <clears throat> that's one of the unique features of this prophecy is that it's uh, organized very well and uh, Ezekiel also carefully dates the prophecies and uh, we can pretty much know exactly the time frame in which he was uh, prophesying and he does these most of the time in chronological order and uh, they're dated according to the years of the captivity of King Jehoiachin and um, Ezekiel was in exile he was in captivity and he was carried captive to Babylon in 598 B.C. And uh, that was about the time that King Jehoiakim was dethroned. And uh, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, remained in the city of Jerusalem. And he predicted the fall of Jerusalem, which was to happen ten years later. But Ezekiel was in Babylon already, and he predicted the fall of Jerusalem from uh, Babylon uh, when it was going to happen and so on. So... You can talk about the phases of his ministry to, uh, around the uh, fall of the city in 587 B.C. And uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, he preached to Judah about their sins, how they needed to repent and get right with God. After the city fell, the uh, fall of Jerusalem, uh, he began to uh, talk to the nation of Israel about being restored to God and being right with God. Now, if you read the book of Ezekiel, you can pretty well figure out you're going to have some perplexing thoughts. It's full of symbols, parables, allegory, strange dreams and hallucinations and visions, and uh, it's a very unusual book. Uh, he talks about nations in terms of plant and animal figures, and he asks questions over and over, and uh, this sentence, Son of Man, see uh, what they're doing, is repeated to uh, Ezekiel over and over by uh, the voice of the Lord. And uh, Ezekiel received his call to ministry in the fifth year of the captivity of King Jehoiakim. That was 593 B.C. And his ministry continued for 22 years. His last date of prophecy was in the 27th year of Jehoiakim's captivity, 571 B.C., and so between these two dates, 593 and 571, there are 14 chronological notices that tell us the exact time frame in which Ezekiel was giving his prophecies. Now what's his name mean? The name Ezekiel means God strengthens. And uh, he was a priest and part of a priestly family. He lived in Babylon among some Jewish exiles in a place called Tel Aviv by the river, river Kiber. And he was married. His wife died the same day that the siege of Jerusalem began. And uh, he had his own house where the elders of Judah would come and ask him for advice and counsel. And uh, many think that that's where the beginning of the Jewish synagogue began. There in captivity in Babylon uh, by these elders coming to hear this priest, Ezekiel, at his home. But when he was 30 years old, he had his first vision. And he never did leave Babylon. He was in captivity his entire life, except for the fact that he went to Jerusalem in a vision later on at the end of the book. And as far as we know, he died in 
Babylon. So that's a little bit of background on Ezekiel. And uh, he's, he's a, a strange figure and a man that uh, had a big impact on the future of Israel after its captivity. Because many things that Ezekiel talks about later on came to be part of the practice and worship of the Jewish people when they went back after their exile, went back to the land and were restored to Jerusalem and their country. So what we will look at is God's call for our day. And what we see is that God called Ezekiel to serve him in a new setting in a strange culture. So think about that. That's where Ezekiel had to do his ministry. A new setting and a strange culture. And uh, he was in the minority there. And what I want us to realize is that God still calls us to serve him today. Amen. He still calls us to serve him today. And just like Ezekiel, it doesn't matter what your setting is or your culture is. He still calls you to serve him. Okay, you don't get to choose. Amen. It's where God puts you and then he calls you. And we may not be in a foreign land like Ezekiel, but we do live in a strange culture that needs a word from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's look at God's call for us today. Because we live in a strange new world. First of all, God calls us in unlikely places. God calls us in unlikely places. Ezekiel probably thought, it's all over. I'm out of Jerusalem, the city is falling, the temple's going to be destroyed. Uh, what, what's a priest going to do now? How are we going to have our uh, ceremonies? How are we going to have our sacrifices? I'm just out of a job. I'm, I'm just not in a place. And that's where God called Ezekiel. And God still calls people in unlikely places. Amen. People get called and they wonder, why did you call me here? Yes. Was it Elisha was plowing the fields when he got called? And God called him, and so what did he do? He went out and slaughtered all the bulls and took the wood of the plow and sacrificed it and put the bulls on the altar and had sacrificed it to the Lord. God calls us in unlikely places. We never know right. where he's going to call us. Amen. And so we can expect that God's going to show up and he's going to ask us to be a part of something he's doing in this world. Because remember, this is one of the basic understandings of this church after we've all studied experiencing God together, God is always at work around us. Amen. And he asks us to join him in his work. Yes. Now, if you're not aware of what God's doing, then he's probably not going to ask you. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a relationship with God and you're in tune with him and you're listening and seeking and, and developing in your spiritual life, guess what? He's going to come to you and ask you to join him in his work. Amen. He's going to give you a call, something to do. So think about this. Ezekiel was in exile in a foreign land with no job and an uncertain future. Mm -hmm. That was his setting. That's where he was. And he's sitting there by the river Kibar, Kibar and he's, he's wondering, what am I going to do now? Right. What happens from this point on? What happens to my people? What happens to me? I, I don't know what God's going to do. Here's what it says in verses 2 and 3. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. And there the hand of the Lord was on him. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would like to be called Buzzy's son. Would you? He was Buzzy's son. But that was his name. And he's sitting there in the land of the Babylonians by the river. And yet suddenly the hand of the Lord comes upon him. The last thing he expected there in a foreign land. Ezekiel didn't know what was going to happen to him from that point on. Yet God came upon him. You see, God calls us to serve him in a new world, a new setting, and a strange culture. God can call us at any point in our lives. Amen. But sometimes it happens when we least expect it in places we least expect. Notice what he said there in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. 
And as he spoke, the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. And he said, son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Amen. I remember hearing Adrian Rogers preach at a Southern Baptist Convention evangelistic uh, meeting, and uh, he was talking about having gone to a revival, and as he was preaching away all week, nobody was coming forward. And he was preaching his heart out Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Nothing was happening. He was getting very frustrated. Lord, did I make a mistake coming here? Was I really supposed to do this revival? What's wrong with this church? And, and finally, on Thursday night, nobody was coming, and he got desperate, and he opened the Bible up, and he just pointed his finger to a verse and said, God, speak to me, and it said this verse right here. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they were rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Amen. And so he just preached his heart out, Amen. whether anybody came forward or not. Well, that's what God says to Ezekiel. Hey, you're going to be in this setting, in this culture, but I want you to speak to my people who've been uprooted and placed in exile. They're stubborn, they're proud, that's why they're in exile. Yeah. They've rebelled against me, and you need to preach to them and get them right with me again. Amen. And that's how Ezekiel began to, to spend his ministry. Now, I would uh, suggest to you that Ezekiel was in a foreign land, a new world to him, a new setting, and uh, he had a different culture all around him, and yet God still called him to serve. And I would suggest to you that, that you and I now live in a new world. Yes. We live in a new setting, yes. and we live in an entirely new culture. You say, preacher, I don't understand what you mean. I still live in America. God bless America, and, and I, I'm proud to be an American. I agree with you 100%. But it's a little bit different of America than the one I grew up in. Amen. Uh, when you turn on the television and you see that Bruce Jenner, the decathlon champion, is now Caitlyn Jenner. Yes. Yeah. It's a different world. Yeah. And yet he's being called courageous and a hero. Mm -hmm. It's a different world. Um, it's a different world when, when uh, I open up USA Today and it says here, a full page ad, we ask you not to force us to choose between the state and the laws of God. And it's talking about the Supreme Court making a decision about same-sex marriage. And these are all people of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faith, pastors and all kinds of clergy and rabbis who are saying, don't force us to choose between the state and spiritual belief. It's a strange day when America Amen. has come to a place where its religious leaders are saying, please, don't force us to choose against God. Amen. We live in a different world. Amen. We live in a different culture than the one I grew up in. And so we, we have all kinds of things happening around us. I, I would have never thought that Billy Graham would be called a hate monger, would you? And yet I read on my Facebook post this week, a fellow was posting about how the Billy Graham Association has pulled its monies out of Wells Fargo Bank because the bank uh, had a, um, a, a gay commercial advertising gay adoption. And so here's what one person wrote. If there's a hell, there's no doubt that Billy and Franklin Graham will be the receptionists welcoming their fellow patrons. Proud of Wells Fargo for not bending to bigotry among coming from these religious frauds who've amassed tens of millions of dollars and live in a multiple mansions by selling hate and intolerance. Did you ever think of the day would come when Billy Graham's called a hate monger and a bigot? And yeah, that's the world we live in. And this guy's attitude is the one that's accepted by most of the culture right now. And you and I are considered hate mongers and bigots because we try to believe what the Bible says about marriage. Amen. I read a report on puberty this week. 
about how the age of puberty has dropped among girls to eight years old now. And how eight, nine-year-olds are sexually active now. And most of the teenage boys get their information about sex uh, on pornographic websites. And uh, the big, big thing among preteens now is to show sexually explicit photos of themselves um, on their, their cell phones. That's not the world I grew up in. That's not the culture I understood when I grew up as a kid and coming through the teenage years. It's a completely different world. And yet God calls us to serve in this culture. There's a big report saying that church attendance has declined to incredibly low levels now. And there's more people who consider themselves no longer church members than those that actually consider themselves church members. And we have all kinds of things happening in our world, from ISIS and terrorism to all kinds of things happening on television and in the movies. And we're just ashamed sometimes to Amen. glance and look at these things. Amen. And yet, God shows up in unlikely places and calls us to serve him. Amen. And that's what he's calling us to do right now, Amen. is to serve him in this day and in this age. And you see, God's always done that. At different points in history, God showed up. He shows up with Ezekiel in a place where Ezekiel thought, he didn't have a future ministry, and God says, yes, you do. Yes, and he showed up down through history to other people yes. over the years, and he said, you've got a ministry here when nothing else seems to be going right in this world. Amen. And, and I remember uh, reading about Fanny Kimball, a British actress who moved to America in the early 1800s. And she married a southern plantation owner named Pierce Butler. And she if, enjoyed that wonderful plantation life had all the wealth of the plantation and uh, the luxury that went with it. But then she began to open her eyes and look around at the cost of that luxury, the cost paid by the slaves who worked on her husband's plantations. And uh, she began to write a handwritten treatise on the way slaves were treated on the plantations and suffered. And eventually Kimball was divorced from her husband. And her writings began to get circulated by the abolitionists and published in 1863 as a journal of a residence on a Georgia plantation, 1838 to 1839. Because of her opposition to slavery, the former wife of a slave over became known as the unlikely abolitionist. God called her from a setting in which she enjoyed luxury at the cost of slaves, and yet God opened her eyes and said, you're going to be my servant and speak against the institution of slavery. Amen. God calls us in unlikely places. And he's still calling us today. He's still calling us in our time. And he's saying to us, what's going on around you and what are you doing about it? Amen. Are you part of the solution or part of the problem? Amen. Are you speaking my word or are you just going along with the flow? What are you doing? God's still calling. What's he saying to you? What's he saying to me? What's he saying to our church here today? You, you see, here's what happens. When you hear God's call and you say yes to it, you, you have this promise that God's glory sustains us in difficult places. Amen. God's glory sustains us in difficult places. I remember reading uh, in, in Ezekiel about the vision that Ezekiel had. And one of the things it talks about is a wheel within a wheel. And I remember back in the 60s when I read this as a kid, um, I looked at it and I said, well, that's describing a gyroscope. And gyroscopes were a brand new thing back then because that was what allowed our, our uh, spacecraft to orbit the Earth and be sure to keep steady and not keep rolling around and so on. And I thought, wow, Ezekiel saw that way back then. But it was a fascinating thing. But this is part of the vision. He had a vision of God, and it's a, such an unusual thing. If you have time later today, read chapter 2, or <laughs> the rest of chapter 1 of Ezekiel, and you'll see this amazing vision Ezekiel had, and it's so unusual. It's so, so out of the ordinary. 
You see, Ezekiel had an unusual encounter with God, and he experienced God's awesome grandeur. Amen. Whatever he saw, he tried to describe it from a human standpoint, it was probably beyond description. And all we have is what he could describe based upon what he saw. And we don't really fully get a clear picture of what that is. It's so far above us. But here's a few things he mentions. I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. And spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. And then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. And above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. He had a vision of God. A vision that was beyond his imagination. Amen. It was overwhelming. And, and, and you know, God, God still speaks. God still gives us visions. Sometimes it doesn't come in an amazing thing like this. Sometimes it just comes in the normal activities of life where God just speaks to us and says, this is why I made you and this is what you need to do. Amen. I was reading a, an article, an interview with uh, uh, a guy named Brooks who uh, writes for the New York Times. And um, the person asking the question said, you know, Francis Perkins was Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor and a major player behind the New Deal. What, what was it about her that shaped her character? And so Brooks says, well, she went to Mount Holyoke College back when the purpose of higher education was not intellectual skills, but character building. And since she was weak in chemistry, the school made her major in chemistry. If you do what you're weakest at, you can handle any challenge. So Holyoke also sent its students around the world on missionary trips, and they picked up this heroic sense that they could do something brave. Well, Birkins graduated, and she was unsure how she was going to dedicate her life. But in 1911, she watched workers die in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. And that gave her what some called her call within a call. She had her career, but now it had become a vocation. And forever after, she would do anything she could to advance the cause of workers' rights. And so she sees this tragedy. And she sees these workers working in unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. And suddenly God speaks to her and says, it shouldn't be. Somebody has to do something about that. And she said, I will, Lord. Mm -hmm. And she dedicated her life and all, rose all the way through the ranks to become Secretary of Labor under Franklin Roosevelt and did her best to improve the conditions of workers. You see, God speaks to us in unlikely places, and he comes to us at times with a vision that we just had never seen before. And suddenly he speaks to our heart and says, do it, do it. That's why I made you. And here's what happens. When you have a fresh vision of God, it keeps us strong as we go through the tough challenges. You know, some, sometimes I hear... Uh, people say, well, you know, I considered becoming a minister at one time. And uh, I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I'm not cut out to be a minister. And I said, well, did you feel God was calling you to be a minister? No, I just thought it'd be a good career choice. And I just, after I get through laughing for five minutes, I say, never go in the ministry full time if God hasn't called you. Because right. sometimes the only thing you got is God's call. Because the whole world's against you. Amen. Including people who are supposed to be your friends. Amen. It's only the call that calls you. Amen. And God's presence that calls you. And a vision of who he is that calls you. Amen. And you stick to that. Because it helps you go through those tough challenges. And this is what happened to Ezekiel. Notice verse 28. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Amen. He sees God. Amen. It overwhelms him, and he falls flat on his face. And God speaks to him. And that was Ezekiel's call, to serve the Lord. 
But he had to get a vision of God first. Because that vision is what going to sustain him when he faced all the opposition he would face Amen. in his ministry. And you know, sometimes uh, getting a fresh vision, it, it may not be like Ezekiel. It could be just a, a new insight from God's word to apply to your life. Sometimes as you're reading the Bible or you're hearing someone preach or you're hearing a Sunday school teacher, some, sometimes God will just speak to you in a way you've never heard before and suddenly there's like a light bulb that goes on in your head and you go, wow, I never thought of it that way before. And it changes the way you look at things. Amen. And suddenly that gives you a fresh vision of God and, and challenges you and excites you and say, wow, this is going to make a difference in my life. Um, those of you that have been here on Wednesday night going through the Dallas Willard study, yeah. um, I don't know about you, but that study has just been transforming for me. Amen. And, and I've just loved it. And, and this past Wednesday night, the question was, how do you follow Jesus? How do you participate in God's kingdom? And, and here's what Dallas Willard said. Do the next right thing and expect God to bail you out. Think about that. Do the next right thing and expect God to bail you out. Yeah. See, we have our little kingdoms, and we want to just build our own little kingdoms and do our own little thing, and we expect, we expect God to maybe support our little kingdom, but, but God wants us to put our kingdom inside of his kingdom. Amen. And God gives us his word, and we read his word, and suddenly his word doesn't match our kingdom, and so we've got to make a choice. Am I still going to be a little... Prince of my little kingdom? Or am I going to fit my kingdom into God's kingdom? Amen. And begin to do what he says. And that's why Willard says, you read God's word, and you do the next right thing, Amen. and God will bail you out. In other words, the way another put it is to obey God's word and expect God to show up. Amen. And so you're having problems in your life. You're wondering why your Christian life's going nowhere. Maybe because you're not listening. Amen. You're not obeying. You're not doing what you already know you're supposed to be doing. Amen. And when you do it, suddenly God shows up. Amen. And you have an encounter with God. And you experience God. And you're overwhelmed with God. And suddenly you're excited again about serving the Lord. Amen? Amen? Good. That's how we become a disciple of Christ. That's how you become a follower of Jesus. We become an apprentice of Jesus by, by doing what he says to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you love me, he said, do what I command you. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have this, this vision from God, this glory from God that sustains us when we go through those difficult times. And then finally, as we, we look at this passage in chapter 3, we see uh, Ezekiel. And God gives him that commission. And here we find that God's word fulfills its purpose in all places. God's word fulfills its purpose in all places. God was given a message to Ezekiel. And this message was to be delivered to God's people. And, and so he was going to take this message and God promised Ezekiel, no matter how they treat you, my word's going to do what it's going to do. Amen. It's going to accomplish its purpose. And, and so here's what happens. Ezekiel was filled with the Spirit of God and given the message to deliver even though no one would listen to him or follow him. So he has a vision from God. He's filled with the Spirit of God. He hears God's voice. And he, God says, this is what I want you to say. But, he, but just a clue, let you know, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to follow you. But, but that's okay. You just do what I tell you to do. Notice what it says in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 3. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Amen. Just do it, Ezekiel. Do what I tell you to do. Speak my word. Speak my message. And as you do that, as you do that, I will accomplish my purposes, Amen. whether they listen or fail to listen. You know, we're living in a day where, where we need to speak the word of God truthfully and fully and completely, no matter what the, the culture around us says. Uh, unfortunately, we have 
We have some major evangelical leaders who are caving in to the homosexual community and um, they're accepting gay marriage. They're letting practicing gays in leadership positions and membership of churches. And uh, the phrase used to be among evangelicals that we're welcoming but not affirming. We welcome anyone into the church, but we don't affirm their lifestyle. Amen. And that's still a valid principle. Amen. But now it's become we're welcoming and affirming. And if you don't accept that, then you're a bigot. Yeah. You're a homophobe. Mm -hmm. You're a hater. Tony Campolo, well-known evangelical leader, came out this week in full acceptance of gay marriage and the gay lifestyle. Brian McLaren, who, uh, whose books I, I love, has already adopted that position. Many other evangelical leaders are taking the same position. And they're looking at the rest of us saying, what's wrong with you? You're just like those racial bigots back in the 50s. You're just putting down the gay community. What's wrong with you? You, you don't love people. You hate people. Franklin Graham took a, a real hit when his organization decided to pull out of Wells Fargo. And so he wrote a, a big full-page editorial in the USA Today. And the editorial said this. He said, I don't hate gays. I, I don't have any animosity toward them. I love them just like I love any person. Um, and he gave several examples of, of how his ministry serves people of all persuasions and so on. He said, but what we couldn't accept was that Wells Fargo Bank had taken a promotional attitude toward the gay community to promote adoptions by gay couples. And we just don't think that is what the Bible teaches. And so we're trying to stand up for traditional marriage and traditional homes. And uh, because of that, we're pulling our money out of Wells Fargo. Well, they took a lot of heat for that. But yet, that's what you're going to have to do in this new world we live in. And this new culture we live in. Amen. And the new setting we're living in. And you're going to get pressured. And you're going to get spoken against. Yeah. And some of you are going to cave in because you can't stand that nobody likes you. Because you happen to have a strong moral stand on this issue. Amen. You have to make a choice. How are you going to stand up in this new world we live in? Amen. You see... God's word is true no matter what the culture says. Amen. We have to stand on truth and practice love. That's it. Stand on truth and practice love. You've got to stand up for what the Bible teaches, Amen. even if it cuts against the grain of society. And yet you've got to practice love Amen. more than you've ever practiced it before. Yes, sir. There, there's no room for gay bashing. No. I've heard Christians... I've heard Christians talk hateful words against gays in the gay community. No place for that. Amen. No place for that whatever. Amen. God loves gays. God loves straights. Yes, God loves all the in-betweens. God loves people. Amen. And Jesus died for every one of us. I was in a hotel uh, yesterday. We went down to the beach. I had a wedding down there at the beach and we were in the hotel, and Karen and I were eating breakfast yesterday morning, and a young man came in, and he had all the mannerisms of a young man who was homosexual, his voice, his mannerisms, everything he did, his laughter. And, and so you gotta, you got to make a decision. How am I going to treat this person? Am I going to bash him and judge him and put him down? Or am I going to love him as Jesus loves him? And so I went up and had a good conversation with him, and and just let him know, you're okay as a person. I don't know anything about you, but I'm accepting you as a person. Amen. And that's the way we need to be. Amen. We, we don't need to do anything except love. Amen. Love everyone. But that doesn't mean you have to accept a lifestyle that goes against God's word. Amen. You also have to stand for truth. Yes. Right? Amen. Notice what it says. Verses 1 through 9. He said to me, Son of man, 
Eat what is before you. Eat the scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I ate it, and I tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. And he then said to me, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. Amen. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. Amen. Karen says, I, I take after Ezekiel. I got a hard head. <laughs> okay. But what God was saying to Ezekiel was, speak my word, be, be hard, be strong, be like flint. Amen. Just, just take whatever comes at you, but yet speak my truth. Amen. Speak it in love. Because they are a rebellious people. Don't be afraid or terrified by them. Now I want you to know that the Shane and I have been talking and planning for a long time. And um, we've just been waiting for the right time. And whether now is the right time or not, I'm not 100% sure. But, but this summer we're going to be speaking on homosexuality on Wednesday nights. And so uh, we, we want to encourage you to come. And hear about this topic. And you may be surprised. We're, we're going to do the topic from several different angles. Because Shane and I probably have a different approach than a lot of the uh, preachers you hear on TV. Uh, because we happen to believe that God loves gay people too. Amen. And that we as a church should love gay people too. But we also happen to believe that God's word has a strong stance on, on the homosexual activity and practice. And so we're going to try to distinguish and, and give you not only scientific and social responses to the gay community, but also the biblical responses. And uh, we're going to try to frame it in a way in which we let the homosexual community speak their side of it, and then we'll show from our angle why we don't think that's correct. And so it'll take several Wednesday nights to go through all that. And so I hope you'll join us on that journey. Because our goal is not to bash gays. Our, our goal is to prepare you so you'll have loving answers for those who are in the gay lifestyle. And you'll be able to respond to them with truth in love. And that will be our goal. We're having on June 22nd at Grace Assembly Church, Gary Adele a Christian lawyer is going to come and speak to about 30 churches that have already signed up. It's called the Summit, and uh, he's going to speak to them about what happens if the uh, Supreme Court decides to go ahead and approve um, same-sex marriage. What happens? How are churches going to be affected? How are religious schools going to be affected? How are religious colleges going to be affected? How are we as a church going to be affected? And he's going to come at it from a lawyer standpoint, and then we'll come at it from a uh, biblical standpoint as to how we can respond. And so you pray for these churches and for Gary Yadell, uh, June 22nd as we go and listen to him. But I just want you to know that like Ezekiel, God calls us in unlikely places, at unlikely times, and in unlikely cultures. And he's calling us right now in this time to face some issues that aren't going to be easy. Amen. And some of you are going to really be offended, and you're going to be hurt because you're going to think that we just need to be nice. And yet the Bible calls us to be more than nice. Amen. It calls us to be faithful. Amen. And that means obeying God's word Amen. and expecting him to show up. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is that like Ezekiel, we'll get a fresh vision of you. And even though we don't understand why we're here at this point in time, our prayer is, Lord, that uh, you'll give us a clear call and a clear vision and give us the courage to step out in faith, believing that you're going to accomplish your purposes for our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation this morning. and God's Spirit is speaking to you. Some of you may just want to come and say, I'm going to pray here at the front. I'm going to commit myself to Christ no matter what he calls me to do. Some of you are going to recommit your lives to Christ. Some of you are going to give your life to Christ for the first time because you realize there's truth that will set you free.
Won't you do that this morning? Let's all stand together as we sing.